well, having a conference maybe about limits to growth and, and, and bigger is not always better and, and most of our thing was based on this kind of older technology with this huge big new technology that we had trouble getting going. Um, but thank you for everybody. We had a bunch of people working here. I know you guys were working very hard to get this done. Um, so the last part of, of the talk uh, of, of this session really is to, to discuss biophysical economics. Um, and what it is. So I put together about five or six slides here uh, that are, are really kind of my personal views on biophysical economics and what I see uh, uh, as a fundamental issue for biophysical economics going forward. Uh, and then Charlie has a, a few slides that he'll talk about and then we would really like to hear um, feedback from the audience if you have questions about uh, with, uh, uh, um, about Jonathan's talk, you can do that as well. My name is David Murphy. I'm from St. Lawrence University. I got a PhD with Charlie at SUNY ESF years ago. Um, but uh, anyway, that's who I am. I should probably introduce myself. Uh, so trying to figure out what any discipline is can be uh, a very difficult thing to do. Um, trying to piece together uh, uh, different parts into, into some overarching theory. And that's basically... Uh, where I started here was a publication that, that Charlie and, and uh, Kent put together a while ago, and there's a definition of biophysical economics out there, believe it or not. Uh, biophysical economics is a system of economic analysis that is based on the biological and physical as opposed to social properties, structures and processes of real economic systems as a con conceptual base and fundamental model. Uh, so that was put out in 2006. The problem I see with biophysical economics right now is that it lacks a theoretical foundation, a unifying principle or something like that. Um, uh, if we look at uh, ecological economics, uh, John Erickson actually had a slide that was in much greater detail than this one that I put, put, put up. But basically you can look back at people like Schumacher and Giogescu, Rogen, Herman Daly, Costanza, and look at the fundamental founding papers of ecological economics that came out in the, uh, in the 80s or late 80s. Um, including the article that says, what is ecological economics? If you look at that paper that Costanza wrote, the heart of that paper talks about limits, limits to growth. It's a macroeconomically focused paper. Um, and that's the kind of the foundation of ecological economics. Um, and this is the theoretical backing, right? Gio Jessica Rogen talks about the laws of thermodynamics and economic growth and how it's preposterous to have this idea of Y equals KL and then throw in resources there. It doesn't really actually fix the issue. Um, Costanza's early work in the early 80s was on the energy theory of value, embodied energy, Schumacher, the problem of production. I teach uh, a class in undergrad right now that we started reading Schumacher, and this book absolutely blows their mind. When they read chapters called The Problem of Production, where he simply just makes the analogy of capital, um, uh, the confusion of, 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 of income and capital and how that, what that means for um, limits to growth. It, it, it really astonishes my students. Um, so this is kind of the theoretical foundation of ecological economics. You look at neoclassical economics and you switch the names around, Jevons, Manger, Wal Walrus, Marshall, the Marginal Revolution of the 1800s. Stuff that everybody here has probably read about. Um, focus here moved from macroeconomic, uh, the political economy of the, of, of the classical economists, to microeconomics, supply and demand, utility, Supply and demand is drivers of price, utility maximization, profit maximization that we already heard about today. This is the theoretical foundation of neoclassical economics. Uh, without a theoretical foundation, I don't see how BPE will, uh, becomes a discipline. Um, it will remain, I think, a sub-discipline of ecological economics and analytical technique. And that's not to say, that's not necessarily bad. It's not in a pejorative sense at all, right? That could, it, that, it just is what it is, right? It's an analytical technique. It's another way of, of viewing um, an economy or a system of sorts. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying here is that I, I, I see this as a whole in biophysical economics. Um, there isn't a text, a unifying theme, or, or some sort of theoretical foundation upon which the rest of uh, biophysical economics can be based. Now, Charlie's probably going to come up and like, tell me I'm totally wrong in a few minutes, but this is my, my uh, kind of my view on things. Um, so uh, I started thinking, well, what would be the theoretical foundation for biophysical economics? And you know what? I came up with a lot of the same names that ecological economics already has, right? Geogescu, Rogen, Daly. Maybe net energy analysis, Charlie Hall, uh, systems analysis, von Bernalanffy, HT HT Odom for sure. Uh, net energy analysis, HT Odom Hall, and net energy analysis is an analytical technique again. So I'm not sure if that can actually serve as a theoretical foundation. Complexity, 
maybe some of the work Richard Norgard and other people have done. Um, but again, I don't see, I don't understand, or I, I guess I'm looking for what the dividing line is between biophysical economics and ecological economics on the theoretical front. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I know where that is. I know that energy return, I know what energy return on investment is. I know uh, uh, how that relates to mac macroeconomics and at least what we think about that. Um, but I think that's the, the missing link right now. If we wanted to, if we want to kind of galvanize biophysical economics and make this into a more formal organization uh, or a discipline, not an organization, but a discipline, we need to kind of uh, develop a more theoretical foundation. Um, and those are my thoughts uh, on that. Uh, Charlie, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to you now, um, and you can give your slides on BP. And then uh, after that, I'll open it up for discussion from the audience. Okay? I'm going to limit you. I'm going to come up. I will, look, I will come up and help you. All right, so let's make sure we don't go. Uh, I'm happy to see my PhD advisor, Howard Odom, get his appropriate due. Um, and, and please make sure you don't run off with the other sheet of this. Give it to me. Um, are you happy with your conventional economics textbook? If you're not, please pick up one of these flyers. Uh, what page? Okay, now, uh, we all know there are problems with economics, and our Pope uh, quite eloquently has told us that. Uh, nobody's laughing. I thought this was really funny. This is our Pope making a snow angel. Next. Uh, but the problem we have with economics is not simply moral. It's intellectual, conceptual, and how does this go forward? You say next and I'll talk <laughs> to you about that. Um, well, Magic. the fellow who was asking about biodiversity, I wrote a book review in bioscience about that and I wanted to tell you my friend Werner drives a great big car because he figures the only, and he's a wildlife biologist, the only way he can save species is to run out of oil. So he's running out as fast as he can, so. But, I, I, I think I did it. I don't know how. I need these slides. You're on that one. We're back on the little one. Okay. Um, Ego. Yeah, well, there it is. Back up. Can you go? That's, don't anybody do anything. That's the next slide. My first definition of economics is the distribution, the social distribution of so-called scarce resources. Uh, to an economist, scarce uh, resources means essentially money in your pocket. It has nothing to do with water, oil, or fish or something like that. And um, I don't like that definition. I don't like lots of things about biophysical economics, but I promised David that I would be gentle in my criticisms. So our second quite different definition of economics comes from Pogliani, and it is economics is a study of how people transform natural resources to meet their needs. Economics is about stuff and the energy required to mobilize that stuff stuff from resources in the ground or water into things we call goods and services. That's a biophysical definition of economics. Why economics has become a social science is a great mystery to me. Why isn't it a natural science? And that's what me and most others, I think, who ascribe to biophysical economics are trying to do is to make economics at least equally a natural science or based on natural science as based on, uh, on social science. And to me, if you don't do that, I can na name you many, many, many problems with economics that way. Okay, next. And here's a standard view of inputs and outputs to an economy by an economist, the US in, I think that was 1900, I mean, uh, 1990. And it's an input of capital, that number is correct, don't you, and labor in an output of GDP. What bullshit? Now, let's look at what really happens in an economy. Next. The inputs are this much oil, these are kilograms, uh, coal, gas, hydronuclear, whatever, uh, water, wood, rock, et cetera. And the outputs are not just GDP, but CO2 or particul particulates, SOX, NOX, you name it, all that stuff. This is what an economy really and truly is. This is what we have to teach our freshmen. That first one is bullshit. It is not true. Next. And this is the basic diagram that's in chapter one of every 
every economics textbook. What can I call, what can I say about it? Bullshit. There's nothing else you can say. Now, there are three fundamental reasons, and this was in Hall et al. in Bioscience in 2001. My email is chall at esf.edu. I'll send you volumes of crap if you want it, showing how this is developed. This is what an economist views as the economy. That is absurd. Next. This is the minimum diagram. That should be in Economics 201, and it should be in your book, uh, of how an economy works. We have natural resources, starting with uh, the energy processes. We have the energy interacting with the materials of the surface of the world. And we have the water cycle. The most important part of our economy is not in an econo economist viewpoint of that economy because it's not monetarized. Well, excuse me. And then we have uh, all the natural processes of the earth and the past processes that laid down fossil fuels and ore concentrations. And then we get into cultural transformations of exploitation, processing, manufacturing, and consumption with the material and energy going along in all of the stuff. It's a lovely little uh, email-y thing that's going around it, and it's on my web page on my home page and it's called um, something about stuff you may remember the story, the story of stuff the story of stuff is wonderful and so anyway this is what the economy really and truly is and you know i heard somebody say oh we've released less co2 last year or it's it's leveled off well so has the world economy and there's all kinds of problems excuse me with some of the things that you say Oh, we've removed CO2. You know how we did it? We used burn more fo gas instead of coal. And what are your grandchildren going to say? Why the hell did you burn gas <laughs> for just stupid electricity that you could make with coal or something else? We need it for fertilizer. We need it for important chemicals of society, etc. And um, there's more, but I mean, I admire very much what you do, but I'd argue with something. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Uh, that's uh, Watts, James Watts, first uh, steam engine, or one of them, and that's been important. Next, uh, this is sort of the same thing your slides say, except maybe they're leveling off, maybe not. Um, and that's our, you made that slide, didn't you? Yeah. I stole it from you anyway. So that's uh, the economy and our use of fossil fuels. Where does wealth come from? It comes from the use of fossil fuels to exploit stuff. Next. Uh, that's a 33 horsepower harvester <laughs> to give you an idea what fossil fuel means. Next, there's a 200 horsepower harvester. <laughs> Does seven times more work with one fifth the labor and uh, one something of the animals. Next, is that five minutes? Yeah, Next, now we do it all. Labor, what are, what are you going to do? Everything we're doing is getting rid of labor. What's wrong with that? Biophysical, biophysical says, let's look at labor in that way. Next, almost done. That, that was it. That was the last oh, slide. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the two slides I thought were there, I can describe very easily. And I can show you, uh, the first is, oh God, I have a great, I'll show it tomorrow. An elephant in the living room. I have a picture of an elephant in the living room. And there are three new reports on the future of fossil fuel that show our use of fossil fuel, including coal, is likely to peak in the year 2025. And these are by Moore, by two Italians whose name I cannot, I can't pronounce, and also by Jean Larere, who's the best source of energy information that I have. I am far more concerned about depletion of quality fossil fuels. There's lots of oil left in the ground, but there isn't lots of stuff we can exploit with a high energy return. And so I'm far more concerned about that than climate change. And we talk about climate change so we're blue in the face. You know, if the volcanoes go back to their normal rate of operation, we're going to be glad, perhaps, to have that CO2 in the atmosphere. And in the oceans. <laughs> in the oceans. And well, is acidification maybe, maybe not. And then 
I'd also like to say that the models of, that project are based 25% on CO2. What's the biggest greenhouse gas, most important greenhouse gas? Water vapor. It isn't CO2. And the model requires, by magic, to increase the water vapor by four times the effect of CO2 in order to get the predictions they do. So there are some things we don't understand very well that we assume we do. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to reduce CO2, but the story isn't quite as clean as a lot of people say, and I'm done. Great. Thanks, Charlie.